I think one of the things that Herb brings to preaching particularly is uh, a connection between the gospel and the context of the time. Uh, he has an extraordinary ability to name sort of the moment that we're in and then help us see that in with his amazing capacity to understand uh, uh, history, uh, where that, that fits with the context and then how that connects with the gospel. Um, and this time that we're in, this pandemic time, um, uh, where I think a lot of us have felt unmoored and the life of the church has been interrupted, but also, and maybe even more tragically, I think right now, uh, since the discovery of the unmarked graves in Kamloops from the residential schools, uh, children, and then the shootings in Buffalo and then in Texas, we need, I think, preachers to help us understand the moment that we're in, connect it with the gospel, and call us into a sense of deeper faith and action in God's world. No, 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 no small task uh, to do it, no small task um, to teach it. Uh, and Peter, I'd be interested too in your, in your thoughts about the value of this forum format for passing that, those gifts along. Yeah, and I think what Herb said earlier about um, how the College of Preaching Preachers at the National Cathedral in Washington was a place of healing as well as learning. Um, it's my privilege right now to be part of the faculty at Vancouver School of Theology. I have been so impressed with the students who are coming through. And then with my clergy colleagues who have been in, shall we say, the fray of these past couple of years, I think what the O'Driscoll Forum is gonna provide is an opportunity for practitioners, uh, preachers to come together to enliven and inspire each other and to find a place of healing and hope as they struggle together with our with mentors and master teachers uh, and, and, and are refreshed in the ministry of preaching by taking a time, two or three days out of their ministry uh, and focusing and building community with others. I think it's an important time for healing and I'm so delighted that VST is going to be the place where this will be a possibility in the years to come. Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, Herb, we've, Cheryl Palmer mentioned storytelling. We've talked about imagination in preaching. Cheryl brought up storytelling. We're going to talk more about that with Joanne in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, you did some writing and speaking about preaching recently for a, for a clergy conference. And there's an excerpt from that talk that I think people might be very interested in hearing today. Have you, is it handy over there on the stand? And would you maybe share that with us now? Thanks, Ian. Not long ago, Archbishop Lynn McNaughton invited me to speak to the Conference of Clergy of the two dioceses, um, diocese of the of the people, as it's beginning to be called, and the Diocese of Kootenai. Um, many of these were quite young clergy, which is great. One of my four addresses to them was on the subject of preaching. I covered more ground with them than I can possibly do here in a few quick minutes, but let me focus on just one subject, which I happen to believe is, is really crucial the power of narrative. You know, one of the things that the 18th century and its enlightenment did was to dismiss narrative as a serious way to communicate wisdom. Narrative was regarded as the communication of inferior people. Story, children told stories. Women told stories until somebody called Jane Austen changed that forever. Indigenous people told stories. Serious communication, of course, was supposed to be logical, cerebral, explanatory, 
intellectual, and of course, primarily male. So when I was at the College of Preachers in Washington, I came to realize that while Western preaching was being excited about the return of narrative preaching, black preaching had never lost it. it. Took me a while to realize that. For that matter, much of the rest of the Christian world has never lost narrative as a means of, as a primary means of communication. African Christianity, South, South Asian Christianity, Hispanic Christianity, our own First Nations. Today, those cultures and more use story very powerfully. And those stories have given back people dignity and self-respect and restored lost spirituality, all of which we need very badly. And something else that's in rather short supply now, they have given back hope. We need to pay attention to this as we prepare for life in the post-COVID church. Unlike preaching that explains and analyzes and informs, there is in story by its very nature an emotional quality. It's difficult not to listen to a story. Fred Craddock, one of the very fine teachers of narrative preaching, says this, the reason many people will overhear a story with more attention that they will give to a lecture or a sermon is that narrative is of the nature of life itself. We dream in narrative. We daydream in narrative. We remember, we anticipate, we hope, we despair, we believe, we doubt, we plan, we revise, criticize, construct, gossip, learn, hate and love, all by narrative. And if somebody tells me a story large enough, with enough memory and enough hope to provide a context for my own personal story, then I am interested. I'll give me an example. In 1963, the Second Vatican Council was in the middle of its huge meeting. One day, a leading member of the council, a Belgian cardinal, actually Cardinal Swenens, was chatting to an archbishop from India. The cardinal asked his Indian colleague, what his people in Asia thought about the council? After a slight hesitation, the Archbishop replied, Your Excellency, they are not thinking about it at all. The Cardinal was astonished. Why is that, he asked. The Indian Archbishop hesitated again. After all, he was talking to a Cardinal. And then he chose to be candid. candid. He said, ah, Your Excellency, if only the Council would tell us a story. If only the Council from the Western world would tell us and itself a story. Having sung the praises of story, oh, and there's so much I would love to do on this. This one comes from Elie Wiesel's The Gates of the Forest. The Baal Shem Tov, sensing misfortune, awaited the Jews, made his way to a certain place in the forest where he lit a fire, said a special prayer so that the misfortune would be averted. Time went by, 
much time. His disciple, the Majid of Mezrich, also foresaw calamity threatening his people. He went to the same part of the forest and he prayed, Master of the universe, I do not know how to light the fire, but I am still able to say the prayer. And he did, and the disaster was averted. More time passed, many years, and catastrophe loomed again for the Jewish people. Now Rabbi Moshe Lieb made his way into the forest, and he said, Lord, I, I do not know how to light the fire, and I, I, I don't know the prayer, but, but I know this place, and that must be sufficient. And it was so. And then, last of all, it fell to the Rabbi Israel of Ritzen to overcome misfortune. He said to God, I am unable to light the fire. I, I, I don't know the prayer. I, I cannot even find the place in the forest. All I can do is to tell the story, and this must suffice. And it did. We need to recapture the story. Thanks, Herbie for that reminder of the power of story. Um, there is someone else with us this afternoon who is a strong believer in the power of story. In fact, she uses it in her ministry and in her pastoral work. And she is also a big supporter of the O'Driscoll Forum. It's Joanne Epley Schmidt from Princeton, New Jersey, where she is Associate Rector at Trinity Church. And Joanne, along with the amazing Joan Roberts, you have been spearheading the American side of the O'Driscoll Forum campaign, and, and you and your family and your church are all significant, generous donors to it, and we thank you for that. But really what we'd like to, apart from hearing about your views about the forum, uh, the storytelling is so important to your own ministry. Um, I, maybe you can weave together that and the influence of Herb and tie it in a ball for us here this afternoon. <laughs> this evening Oh, I will you. try so hard <laughs> so to do. <laughs> To, to speak of the power of narrative preaching, as Herb has taught and mentored so many of us here in the United States, let me just put it to you this way. Some years ago, I had the great joy of serving as the Episcopal chaplain at Princeton University. And one of the spectacular moments in that ministry is celebrating the great vigil of Easter at five o'clock in the morning in the pre-dawn dark of that first Sunday of Easter. And in that service, the first part of the liturgy, the liturgy of the word is, is said there in the university chapel, which is cathedral-like in scope. And there you are in the chancel in the dim with the candlelight hearing the stories read. And by the time you finally arrive at the proclamation, the Easter proclamation, Christ is risen and the trumpet sound and the hymns are sung, and it's time to hear the Easter gospel and the sermon is to be preached very dramatically. And so conveniently, the sun outside has risen as well. And the great apse window of Christ in glory is lit up in full color. It's a pretty good setting to step out as I had the chance to do as the preacher one morning at about six o'clock in the morning. And when I came to the center, I simply started this way. I said, we can imagine it happened this way. The women, several of them, are gathered in a small house on the east side of the city, Jerusalem, grieving, remembering, quiet, in a moment, one of them heavily stands up and looks out and sees the rim on the eastern horizon slowly lightening. She gets up, another one does. They pick up the baskets, the jars of ointment, the linen. They bend out the door and they head their way to the tomb. 
I told the story because I learned from Herb the great value of traveling deliberately through the story in time and place and detail, like recalling that one of them would catch the aroma of the spices from the jar she was carrying, which would remind her of the costly perfume she had poured on his feet and how he blessed her for it. And Judas complained of the expense. Or something like how, how their eyes started to sting and perhaps it was tears or perhaps it was the smoke that would rise from the refuse piles as they walked their way down the angled streets of the city, down towards the killing place or how they would feel when they pass the splits of wood that stretch out their beams like hideous compass markers along their way. And the value of making sure you mention all the senses, like as they get closer to the tomb, the, the hum of the first bees in the morning, the first single notes of bird song, the sweetening air, the heavy coarse linen, that they carry and they wear and the dry taste in their mouth as they get closer and closer to the tomb. And of course, the deep emotion of it all because all they wanted, all the story tells us that they wanted was to serve their Jesus one more time, one last time out of love. And when they get to the tomb, nothing is as they expected. And the reason I tell you of this sermon was because after the service, a young man come to me who had never been to the church before. And he was, he was vibrant and he was delightfully inarticulate because he just kept saying the sermon, it was I, the story. I never, I, I was, I could, I was feeling and it was the, it was the story. What was wonderful was that his eyes were searching the air and I could see that he could see it all. He could see the women, he could see the tragedy, he could see the tomb that was empty and it was empty for him. It was empty for him on that Easter morning and there were possibilities for him of the risen Jesus Christ that was more and different from anything he expected. And I just think of how often in training at the college, Herb would say, make it live, make it live. Take the scripture, tell the sacred story in its fully realized imagination, Christian Midrash, one would say, as Herb has often said, and make it live because telling the story fully, our sacred story, preaches more good news to a world, as Peter named, that desperately needs that good news. It preaches more good news of Jesus Christ than reams of rhetoric ever could. And that is why I, and my family and my friends here are so glad that the O'Driscoll Forum will be there to make sure the story is told and told well. Joanne Epler Schmidt, thank you so much. And thanks for all that you are doing for the forum. I, can I remember a moment, some, just a moment, promise? Just a moment. Just a promise. In Iona, one evening in Iona, um, there was a group of us in one of the rooms and we were thinking about such things and, and I remember looking across the, um, the group of about 20 or 30 people and uh, Joanne was one and she had come in a little late so she still had a, had a, a raincoat on and, and, and heavy walking boots. And she was sort of draped across this sofa or a big chair. And I said to myself, this woman gets it. I always remember that moment. I knew she is getting it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.